this week off. First, having read the book of myths and loaded the camera and checked the edge of the knife blade, I put on the body armor of black rubber, the absurd flippers, the grave and awkward mask. I am she, I am he, whose drowned face sleeps with open eyes, whose breasts still bear distress, whose silver, copper, vinyl cargo lies obscurely inside barrels, half wedged and left to rot. We are the half destroyed instruments that once held to a course, the water-eaten log of the foul compass. We are, I am, you are, by cowardice for courage, the one who finds our way back to the scene, carrying a knife, a camera, a book of myths, in which our names do not appear. Dead in the dark. So, the neighborhood, the neighborhood, community. So we had some very, very good things this week. Um, uh, Amin and Zani's work on There Goes Gaberhood. Some uh, very interesting notes and quotes that struck me. One, as the country opens its arms to openly gay and lesbian people, the places we call home have grown beyond urban gay ghettos. The advocate welcomes you to this new American landscape. Um, right? Let me just see what that looks like. And there was another lovely one that juxtaposed so well uh, from John D'Amelio that environmental answer quotes if one scratches below the surface of any gay life one will find a bottomless well of pain whose source is oppression so those really kind of stuck out to me about what we're talking about we had some about Park Slope um, in Mignon Moore's work mentions uh, Flatbush, Harlem, South Bronx um, Absolutely, too. And then Anna Lance's work on Jackson Heights. I have lots of things to say about these, but I bet you do too. So, what were you guys thinking when you were reading them? I was thinking, wasn't it nice to read about race? That's what I was thinking. I guess one of the things that I was thinking about. Um, last week um, and then thinking about um, the hate crime of this week was the way that the New York Times posted it as like this hate crime happened right outside of Stonewall and like of all places for there to be a hate crime we can't believe it's there and so I thought that was an interesting way since we've been sort of talking about the role of Stonewall and you know different neighborhoods um, in New York um, that that's now used as sort of like a I'm not sure how the New York Times used it, but it was interesting, I think, to, to consider, um, oh, hate crimes happen in the West Village. Like, we're shocked, because when there's so many gay people together, then there shouldn't be hate crimes or something. I, I'm not sure. Or it, just, it became some sort of safe space, so it's immune from violence. I'm not sure. That's, that's just what's been on my mind this weekend. <laughs> there's a, 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 a great piece by Sue Ruddick, who's a feminist geographer for Toronto. And she writes about this, it's in 1990, there was this thing called the Just Desserts shooting. And it, it's because it happened in a suburban mall by an immigrant, a dark screening woman who shoots a white screening a man who shoots a woman, that it makes the news and all the other murders that we don't. Um, and becomes a, 
political outcry. Uh, many of you mentioned Christine Quinn last week, who was on the cover of AM New York. I think, I think um, so. And I think it stands in contrast for me since I moved here from Laramie, obviously, like in the wake, the way wake after, but that wake never ends out there um, with Matthew Shepard. But that somehow that place became like, well, it happens there because there's not that many gay people and everyone there hates gay people, so like it's <clears throat> bound to happen or something. So I think the contrast for me has just been interesting as someone who's lived in, I think we've all, right, we all live in a place where hate crime exists. Um, but just the different ways in which this crime didn't even really get too much New York Times coverage, actually. Um, and it's two pieces that I know of. Yeah, it just, I don't know, it just has me. Yeah, I'm, it, I, in my style work, I'm trying to think about hate crimes, and there's a huge rhetorical element what gets called a hate crime uh, and what doesn't. And it's not always good. I mean, I watched the Pilot Committee thing in New Jersey and I thought there was a, there was a huge com political component to, to that and actually to work with the defense of <laughs> But um, I, I wonder what part of this is about place. It's sort of weird. It's like somewhere else it would be okay, but not, I mean, what did they think? I mean, and, and even, I don't live in New York, but but from what I read about, parts of Christopher Street are very contested territory mm -hmm. in the readings. And, and, and not to see that as a suggestion that it's all up for grabs, perhaps always, is very weird. And I think part of what this is about is what you mentioned in your piece, that there's a kind of, the imaginary of the neighborhood is that everyone in the neighborhood is of the same category of person, whatever that category is for whatever neighborhood it is. And in Christopher, you know, in the village, that means everyone is happy to be around the queers and not queer themselves. Right? At a beatnik. Right. right. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I was my. So I, I was actually thinking about what it said in the Nile last same article about like structural violence and with respect to sort of all this like the Matthew Shepard stuff, yeah. even how that plays out in hate crimes legislation, right? And how like there's a majority of people of color were disproportionately impacted by the sort of criminal penalties of that. And while hate crimes I personally believe do exist, is the criminal justice system increased penalties going to actually like address any of that? So I think about what right and there's there's back and forth arguments about that and I would actually say, you know, maybe not so much. And this is coming like I'm an anti violence person, like that's what I've been doing for the last, you know, eight years. Um, uh, thinking about like whose stories are told and whose aren't told, and you know, I think I referenced like you know sort of like the regular murder of trans women of color and sex workers and things yeah. like that, and how that plays out. And this, and I think one of the interesting things of this particular hate crime with the you have a person of color who is shot by ostensibly another person of color, and it just sort of continues the cycle of like whose stories are told and whose aren't told. Um, and it's funny because when I first heard about the, the rally, I was like, oh my god, is this going to be like some Christine Quinn like? Like right. political mm -hmm. thing, and yeah, I was to be like, like, yeah. Right. yeah, right. And so I'm glad it actually became, and I didn't feel unfortunately, but there was, a, I'm glad it sort of became more diffused, and that there were other stories and voices that were, you know, heard. So, anyway. Um, yeah, I just want to say about the sense of imaginary safety that comes with certain spaces, mm -hmm. and so that's partially what I think. I think to me that was the part of that was the, the shocking element <clears throat> and like the attack that happened in the Stonewall um, itself a few years ago. <clears throat> I mean, I was attacked in a Stonewall by a straight uh, cis man who like tried to actually drag me out and was extremely offended to hear that I'm a lesbian. <clears throat> was in a Stonewall at a bar. Um, and so, and there was actually a few years ago, um, while the place where I work, uh, where I, I do my art, is women and trans people here at a collective, and we had a situation where one of our performers was attacked leaving the space outside. So there are these spaces that I think we just assume safety because of the neighborhoods and because they're presumed queer neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's where this kind of the shock effect. And I mean, I don't think that they are actually safe, clearly, but there's this imaginary safety that we create as a part of this well, narrative we today. So or we get really angry again and act up. Yes. I think a big part of it is also a, a class thing. It's the class thing of the West Village, because the West Village 
the class of the West Village isn't the same as it was in the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's still in some ways a gay neighborhood, but it's for the vast majority of people in upper to upper middle class to upper white neighborhood. And that that is like another element of why this is shocking. And I think that that also, I, I don't know how exactly, but I'm sure that that kind of plays into the surprise of like, oh, and it wasn't white men. Um, which I think is probably the, one of the reactions to a lot of people who read that article is like, well, like, first of all, how could this happen in this neighborhood? And second of all, what were these people doing in this neighborhood? Which is totally driven by race and class, and all of these neighborhoods are. I mean, I think we most people have been to Parcel recently think of it as a pretty white place, right? Yeah. Um, and Trey's description of Grand Army Plaza, um, uh, my piece, was really palpable. In fact, all women of color who lived anywhere near Prospect Heights um, or Flatbush talked about Grand Army Plaza as being this very defining line uh, for over 15 years or something. And I ran into one of them recently and I said, oh, I'm writing about this. And I was like, I think it changed. And she's like, yeah, it's at Franklin Avenue now, which is a subway stop. And for 15 years, it's a Grand Army Plaza, right? With the Grand Army Plaza being this kind of big, vacant, open space, but it got redesigned. Um, people, like, there's a lot more money, not really going to the library, but there's people going to that the library. Um, people, Barnes and Noble's closing, people have found libraries again. And there's that huge amount of gentrification moving these um, so the tray, you know, can wear, you know, can get to Franklin Avenue, and then if she says fuck with it, you know, then then she can make out with her girlfriend. Um, just a really crazy, insane, measured way to live. Yeah. But I think that that's just making me think that that's also really interesting because we're talking about the sort of like how neighborhoods are neighborhoods and they have, might have a certain type of people in it, but then we assume that everything's homogenous within a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And then I think the subway like fucks with that in really interesting ways because it's all people going from one place to another. And so what about, you know, what's the difference between being at Group Avenue and being at Grand Army Plaza if you're on the subway and everyone's going from one place to another? Mm -hmm. I've seen subway populations, the people in the subway, turn over pretty quickly at certain stops, really. Yeah, right, right, and then you'll see, like, they're going in one direction, and it's all black, and you, the people going in the opposite direction uh, across the track are all white and Asian. Like, you see that in Queens, especially. Mm -hmm. And it's also, I think, there's a lot of white privilege to, to, to do what you want at any stop, too, uh, for being there as white, um, and how the class works, that no one's going to look in your bag, right, within the New York City place, or not going to look in your large object and see what it's in. Um, so, also, Jackson Heights, hey, uh, something that really stuck out to me, too, was thinking about all the foodies who went there. <laughs> and I, and I, that might have been, you know, if somebody references, there's a bunch of white people on the street and I don't know where they came from. And I was like, I think they were there for the food um, at that time. Um, uh, and, uh, um, I don't know if everybody knows what neoliberalism is, so I, I actually wanted to tell you and reveal one of those lovely words, uh, which is uh, David Harvey, who's a geographer, who started around 1973 after the, the oil crisis, and it was a, a shift in economic policy um, that corporations were treated more as humans and given more rights than actual human beings. Um, we started to do more work for less pay, volunteer more. Um, and there's a, a lot of uh, the shifting inequality, right, and the, the way taxes work. There's a lot of aspects of that. Um, David Harvey's book on neoliberalism will sum it up and you just sit there open mouth if you haven't read it. Um, and these kind of policies really changed. And that's the, the moment that the, the ghettos are starting, right? The gay ghettos in the 60s and the 70s are starting pre-neoliberalism, 60s or 70s. 
And then by the 80s, um, it's 1983, the word gate, uh, neighborhood comes out. It's the first time ever used in literature, and I mentioned that, that Manuel Castell was like, no, no, look at what they've done to the real estate. These people are lovely. This is a neighborhood. Look at the cash flow. It's lovely. Look what they've done to the... And he's not, he's saying it as like, he really sees it as a social movement, but when you go back and you read it in reverse, you see that what's happening is, is the massive gentrification of the cash row. And there's also this very um, sexual determinist thing where, where men are, he actually has, says, have a territorial imperative to make these spaces, and women love to meet at potlucks. Um, they have these networks he doesn't quite understand. Um, yeah, I forget where the, where the tragic quote is. Um, but it, it's in here. Like the top of one page. Um, anyway, uh, and, and a lot of people have written about that, but women are more in these kind of concentrations. I have an a, a anecdotal story about, um, or incident about Park Slope that um, there's this guy named Randy Wicker who led the first gay rights protest um, in like in post Weimar. And um, so he, uh, and he's still around. And um, he moved out of the village in 1964 and dropped out of the gay rights movement because he was frustrated with it. And so he, uh, he was, he was kind of, he was, he was a big deal in the third wave of Madison society. The ones that like brought it back out into public engagement. And um, he, um, when he moved out of the village and went into Park Park Slope, uh, just north of the Circle. Um, he brought with him his little gaggle of Puerto Rican boyfriends that were living with him in this gigantic apartment. But there was a there was a palpable drop in the amount of <coughs> activities that are done by Madison Society of New York and by people gathering in his button shop on West Fourth Street to do things in in Manhattan. To where like the next blurbs about him, he's doing marijuana legalization and peace movement stuff uh, at, with, uh, with a totally different set of people um, that are like, uh, like, um, uh, uh, like um, Allen Ginsberg, the people that wouldn't associate with Madison society anyway. And so it actually, like, when people sort of move out, there's, uh, there's like a, sometimes you see a vacuum, because this is the guy who's hyperactive and he actually did the first outreach on the East Coast for Managing Society. You mean like in the West Village? Or in the North he, moved, he, he left the West Village and also left the gay rights movement, and there was a cluster of younger gays that left Madison at the same time that sort of followed him out. And um, they, uh, and so it's kind of interesting on one part that he, he talks about how there were women gay women that he knew in Park Slope, and that there was this very similar geography to what you're talking about of networks of women, but he had his little compound, like a four-bedroom apartment with his little harem of Puerto Rican boys. Yeah, and, and Park Slope was very Puerto Rican for a very long time, and also there were a lot of, um, there's always been a couple, couple of women's spaces there, at least since the early 70s, like the Pia Bookstore. A women's bookstore, I think, and it was a women's, all women's gym. Yeah, yeah I, 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 this reading was really interesting, and part of it was the mm -hmm. contrast between gay men moving into a neighborhood. And I, I saw this in Washington, D.C., where, I mean, they really were understood to be bettering the neighborhood, but also eventually raising the property values and the blacks would move out. And uh, it didn't happen, there was a kind of cluster in Brookdale. One, one neighborhood near a subway stop and sort of cheaper real estate. I'm trying to, I mean, it's, is the difference some kind of gender territoriality or is it that men had the money to fix up the houses or to buy and fix up the houses, which would foster gentrification in the way that people, uh, groups of women usually, in, in, in my experience, renting didn't. Why do we take it back to the capital on that one? Because it's 77 cents on the dollar, two women have a dollar yeah. fifty-four, and the guys got two bucks, and that wow, that accumulates and wow, interest. You know, I've learned so much about interest since student loans. So, you know, I think <laughs> that, uh, the other part that's of that a massive is amount of money. street safety, because in my view, tell me if I'm wrong, is that in in many neighborhoods, just categorically women are not a safe on the street, so they're not going to structure street life in the same way, it seems to me, on average. 
or they are, or they become, or they're sexualized in a way yeah. that makes them sad. So, the, so the, 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 or they're the, ignored the, the men. When you're visible on the street as a man, it's just different, and I think easier to kind of move your culture into the street. Right. Yeah. Were you at the time? Oh, someone asked? No? Oh, I, I just was thinking of Ira Katz Nelson's book on the New Deal and how the entire mortgage industry, all the policies coming out of Roosevelt, you know, everything was just set up for white male privilege to just gulp up so much space in the city where we always think of it as the, you know, great ushering in of the welfare state, but it wasn't with the GI Bill and with um, home mortgages and stuff like that. So I think that speaks to a little bit of it. But I'm still kind of stuck with walking in on the opening of the hate crime this week and just to think about race and how it really reminds us not to make facile connections of presuming people have minoritized identifications to one another. Um, and just in thinking of the, the readings for this week in constantly about claiming spatial access for urban justice and activism, you can tell I'm really moved. Um, this idea that the right has always couched things also in spatial and temporal terms, but we never look at it in our activist writing somewhere. Um, you know, when people say that they feel encroached upon and they're coming to take my piece of my pie, everything is always also framed from the right, um, spatially and temporal. Yeah. Get off my land. You're taking my piece of my pie. They're coming for my rights, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, meanwhile, neoliberalism will make the corporation like a person, but, you know, so will idiots make the fetus like a person, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the point is, is that the attacker of the attackee must have, spatially in terms of your class, also felt encroached upon on that street and in that neighborhood, mm -hmm. which I think is so profound to, to try. It's so difficult to sympathetically move into walking into the shoes of another in this way, right? But to, to try to get our minds around why um, perpet perpetrators of, of hate crimes must be feeling spatially somehow delimited in their, in their privilege, right? And also similarism, because you brought it up, you know, how I think it really demands that we rework a lot of uh, theoretical assumptions about intersectionality of cla cla class, race, sexual orientation, and gender in terms of just thinking about this one incident. What are the appeals on that street and in that neighborhood? You know, and, and we'll give a lot of props to corporate media for identifying it as you know the neighborhood of Stonewall. Okay, props for that this past week. But you know, what what were the claims? Um, to white privilege as a non-white identified person to making spatial claims on that street, you know, and how how do we begin to craft a language for those of us that care about space and place um, for radicalized identities? How can we begin to identify when hatefulness and um, and other right rightist forces are actually making privilege orientated claims? in the embodiment of another. And I think that that it's just so profound, you know, because we can't make simple racial identifications or class-based um, identifications um, in this incident at all, right? A lot of people use the right to the city rhetoric. Right to the city, you know. And that's where <coughs> Occupy went a lot, the right to the city and the right to Occupy, um, uh, which a lot of colonial, anti-colonial, post-colonial groups came back and said, Occupy, you know, it's similar to colonizing white. And then again, it becomes spatial. Yeah. Um, a lot of work that I saw at the Homo Nationalism and Pinkwashing Conference equated uh, settler colonialism with gentrification, although there's, there's definitely differences between those things and the, um, the kind of harsh oppressions and violences involved in settler colonialism uh, and killing mass millions are not the same as gentrification. Um, so, uh, I don't quite, I definitely don't have the answer to that question. And I, I usually, I don't really go to the right to the city stuff because I feel like it's, it just takes me back to the, to the depth. I think when yeah. I've just been, I call her Sally, 
calls it it's something a little I remember she said it like this, there's something a little insidious about colonizing a piece of land and calling yeah, it your own. Your own. You know, and I I feel that still in my body. I know that way too. So I don't know, but neighborhoods are the way to be, you know. Let's go back again to Jane Jacobs, uh, who wrote about how annoying she felt neighborhoods were, and it was really about street life, and street the life. sidewalk ballet, and that's how we get to know one another. Um, but it's the city, it's the it's, it's a political way to handle and structure people, just like the, the structure of the family is, the same way we make neighborhoods, to classify people, to talk about people, um, making them into historic districts. So. You know, now if you live on the Lower East Side, you really are, if you're anywhere near middle class or so you're not going to be able to remodel your home in a way that fulfills the, the, the preservation society dictates so you'll have to sell it um, so that it will be gutted and they'll leave the frame there and then put in condos. You know, so there's, there, uh, there's how, how, will we, how will we change this and how we fight this? Is it the right to the city where they're from? Were you going to say something before, Philip? Uh, well, I was just sorry. Some of the things we're reading about that are things that have happened first week have actually, some of the people the crimes have, have tried to turn the city towards transients, where uh, there's one last, uh, I'm, I'm losing track of which evening, which happened at this point, because it's coming out so rapidly. Um, but you know, one of the, the, the perpetrators, or the alleged perpetrator, uh, had been spending time in a homeless shelter. Uh, I know this person who committed the, the shooting. Uh, this is like staying with friends and like the rock or something like that. And um, I think what I feel like is that there's there's a, another level, level of displacement that's happening to various populations based upon their political history, their class, their race, and whatnot. Um, and I think we're seeing it play out in these sort of neighborhoods who perceive us free. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's there are other layers of, of, of personal histories and class that are sort of involving <coughs> the incidents of space. I don't I don't it's it's it, I think it's. It's a coincidence that it happened so close, so close to Stone Wall. Mm -hmm. um, when we really, we really that men have this sort of what they seem to have been doing is just going out for drinks on Friday night, and then having these various interactions that they have with people of other classes and of other uh, sexual orientations and gender contact with them. Yeah, and, and it's, it's it's unfortunate that those things are happening. We're playing out these really violent ways, but I, I think there's I think there's it's, I think there's something beyond just a claiming of a specific neighborhood. There's, there's mm -hmm. incidents in the city that sort of. Um, roving population of people at this point, just trying to grow up in Manhattan where they now just drink all the time. <laughs> and it's interesting that, that I just want to make sure that, that, that the neighborhood is positioned as this very placed and historic thing versus the transient, the placeless. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's that's where you're really bad. What about people who don't have neighborhoods? You know, right, what? So what? Well, where, where do all of these, like, where do all these negotiations play out and these interactions um, resolve themselves? It's a whole way of speaking in New York, right? There's a whole way that we have conversations around New York. So I, I don't mean to, your point to making it more complicated or important, but I, to my thinking, in some sense, the perpetrators of hate crimes and their motives uh, and where they come from are not as important as the story that's told mm -hmm. about the crime, mm -hmm. uh, which is one reason the rhetoric is so important. Uh, because a lot of times, I, I, buy, I think I think hate crimes are done sort of opportunistically. It's not that somebody is set up because they have this intense rage against any particular group. There's somebody that it sort of happens, uh, nasty rhetoric pops out of their mouth, while well, it's a hate crime. And it's understood by various people in the community to be targeted. And then that whole thing takes off. But the perpetrators can come from a lot of places mm -hmm. and still be swept up in this complicated notion of the hate crime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking about this idea of hate crimes, and I don't know, the spot isn't full yet, but I'm wondering if we can um, call uh, some of the political moves or the structures hate crimes. I'm wondering if that kind of. Like what? What do you mean? Um, Well, yeah, I, I can't come up with an example, but I'm wondering how we define a hate crime as <coughs> one against another, whereas there's so much social inequality and, and you know, systemic mm -hmm. um, imbalances that I, I don't know, I think I just want to, I, I know that it's a powerful term, and I would love 
for She's at the structural right. level. Yeah. And Marcy, I'm very excited to write a new policy over there. No, 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 I'm, 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 I hope you do it. I try, well, let, let me give you one example. So part of hate crime rhetoric is not invoked uh, when you defraud elderly, defraud elderly people. And I don't see that as a hate crime at all. But it's, it, 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 we ought to have hate crime. Maybe it's a crime against the vulnerable. To me, I think hate crimes in their central use involve violence and territory. But they, it gets involved for all kinds of things. That's why your question is so interesting. I don't know quite what you mean by structural. Well, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, in the first week of class, we were talking about um, the frisking of young men in Harlem. Mm. Mm -hmm. And, I never, you know, mm. I like I seeing I stuff and frisking. Yeah, like I'm not sure if it's a hate crime. I just know that that's a powerful word, and I, I know that think it's kind of a. I generally don't believe in hate crimes. Like I think that they're, they're like a mechanism of the prison industrial complex, and kind of like adding on sort of like adding on to sentences for people who aren't going to be getting any more like they're not going to be made any better by their specific purpose. And I think that hate crimes have to do with kind of um, trying like the belief that you can really kind of look into someone, look into the mind of the perpetrator. And like um, and read intent, and I think that um, and I think that the state of the prosecution feels more able to do that in certain sorts of circumstances, like if they're people of color or you know they're um, or like I don't know like we're talking about the disparities in the way that hate crimes are kind of like doled out more often to people of color or that people. And I think that that's wrong, and I think that um, and. Yeah, and I just don't, I don't believe that it, it doesn't work. I'm trying to keep the truth in any way. So Sarah McCollum, yeah. Um, I'm, I agree with a lot of what you said. I don't know if I agree with 100% of it, but I think it is, hate crime as a concept is used in a, in a strategic way in many, many cases, because it is like this loaded term that people mm -hmm. throw down, similar, and I, you know, equate that with, um, like the, the way the term terrorism is used, it's like slapped onto something, mm -hmm. and therefore mm -hmm. it's supposed to therefore have a whole bunch of different effects that you hope will happen. It's an extreme, provoke an extreme reaction. Um, and in that sense, I mean, in some way, it, it loses its teeth also, because what does happen out when you call something a hate crime? Well, clearly, nothing has totally improved in terms of, you know, stop and frisk all happens. There are um, I think a million different things that could technically, mm -hmm. I guess, qualify as hate crimes, depending on what definition you're using, that still happen. So I wonder what is the more effective way of dealing with that, mm -hmm. rather than just having this kind of extreme label applied to it. Um, you know, and I don't know if it operates in the same way. Yeah, I think, uh, hate crime legislation works so perfectly with like a neoliberal moment, right? Where uh, their concepts of privacy and rights to the city and rights to my body, right? Where for it to work, not only do you have to assume you can see inside the mind of the uh, perpetrator, but also it assumes that there are people or bodies that are naturally hateful. Right, so, and often those are people of color, right, or working class or lower class people. Um, and it allows us to stop critiquing structural violence, mm -hmm. right, really looking at like, how is hate produced? How is homophobia produced on a structural level? Instead, it places it solely into <clears throat> people's bodies, um, mm -hmm. which is... Uh, and it leaves us for us to work out rather than changing yeah, homophobia right. was just taken yeah. out of the DSMs precisely for that reason. They give a very, you know, structural um, defense of saying, you know, we should be addressing always heterosexism and heteropatriarchy, not homophobia, right? Mm -hmm. So hate is is it's synonymous with homophobia. It's individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like um, like about immigration and looking at anti-immigrant policy. And so in that context, um, most of the hate crimes that I've looked at have actually been hate crimes that, um, against like undocumented immigrants for the most part, which are largely um, committed by white people, <laughs> white men. 
Um, and so in that, in, in that context, I, I actually think it's quite effective um, in protecting people who are <coughs> otherwise like very marginalized by the legal system. Um, so I think maybe it has like a, a it's a different context than the homophobia context, than the sort of hate crime against against the LGBT community. Um, but the other, so that was sort of the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is, you know, I was thinking about um, I did my graduate work at, at Rutgers, and and while I was there, was when the there was that hate crime committed against the um, the kid who committed suicide. I'm blanking on his name right now. Oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Um, and there were so many good discussions that I participated in at that time about, you know, how the legal system and the media was just like eating the quote unquote perpetrator alive, right? And that seemed very racialized. Yeah. Um, and it was racialized and also immigrant of guys, whatever. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I, but then, but then I, I recall. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have like the worst memory in the world. It's always just fragments. But I recall that there was an article maybe a year or two ago in the New Yorker that was about the case yeah. that was used for the sodomy. Somebody want to help me out here? Yeah. Florence Yeah, thanks. Um, and how the two guys that were um, held up as this like, you know, whatever, the gay poster child love and the happiness and whatever, and really like they barely knew each other and they weren't a couple and whatever, but they were just, the, the lawyers just kind of manipulated the story and this speaks to what you were saying about the story that was told, right? They, they, you, they, they transformed the story that was told about it to, to have the, you know, to, to have the court strike down the sodomy laws and change it to love and not sex and blah, blah, blah. And so I was thinking about that in the context of the um, Tyler Clemente case and how um, really uh, I, I think that the you know that a lot of these organizations, these legal organizations, were just like waiting for a moment, right? Like they just they needed a um, you know a bullying case. They needed a kind of bullying homophobia case so that they could then transform into the the. Um, the, the thing that was on the books, you know, that was going to change the landscape forever. And, and so, I don't know, I have those two, that I think there's a kind of tension there between the sort of manipulation of the legal system to a positive end, and also um, sometimes a positive end, right? Not always. Um, and then, you know, on the flip side, just thinking about, like, hate crimes against communities, uh, like, you know, like, for example, they're on Long Island, just, sorry, just to finish this thought, like on Long Island, um, maybe in the early 2000s, there was that um, that Ecuadorian guy and his brother, right? That's, that's the super yeah. What's that? They're, they're the super yeah. <coughs> yeah. No, no, there was a Long Island case. They were, they were... They were holding hands. They were holding and hands. One of them was killed. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. This is <coughs> what happened was there was another case on that Long Island with a day laborer, but that was the first one. Oh, okay. Keep going. Yeah. yeah, but anyway, so so um, thanks the fragments. I know. So um, so the uh, so it, it was like at first it was like oh the hate crime was because they were gay but they weren't actually gay. So then it was like oh actually the hate crime is that they're you know Hispanic. Um, and and but but actually in actuality it was like a double hate crime as far as I can tell. Um, so anyway, sorry. That's just those were a lot of thoughts, but maybe. Yeah, yeah, actually, I'm actually really glad that you said that. Okay, so I'm an attorney and I do uh, anti-violence work. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just a framework. So I think that there's some of the um, sort of thought that people are having about critiques of the criminal justice system. So like with the crime, it requires two elements, sort of start to get all, whatever. Actus reis and mens rea. So basically, your intent mm -hmm. and an action. Mm -hmm. So you need both intent and an action. And so the way hate crimes legislation plays out is that the belief that the part of that intent for committing that action is motivated uh, by sort of hatred for a particular group. And sort of hate crimes legislation is based on this idea that um, the sort of the damage of that is not just for that individual person, but also for that community. So that's sort of how that plays out. Um, I think one of the things that the legal system isn't really so good at is examining those gray areas, right? And also thinking about things in a complicated way. Because it is a binary system that has um, victims and perpetrators, defendants and complaining witnesses, petitioners and respondents, it plays out in this very sort of black and white sort of thing. So you have, even within your times today, the sort of like, you know, the, the sex offender village, right? Like, or with terrorism or with hate crimes, these are very broad strokes to strike that often are tools 
say by um, uh, a district attorney's office to sort of tell and craft this story, which often has you know sort of ripple effects in 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 in, in like sort of the public sphere. Um, and so impact litigation is sort of like the finding of a case where they think they can ultimately, by taking it up to courts, affect policy because it continues that conversation at each stage of the court system and the appeal process. But also, you know, I think you sort of lionize the people who are there for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. um, I think, and I'm actually really glad that you brought up the Tyler Clemente thing because you'd be fine <coughs> is in sort of the same criminal justice um, prison industrial complex critique, the sort of integration of the criminal system becomes sort of even at an earlier stage. So, um, and for younger people. And so I've been reading a lot about bullying lately because I think about it a lot in the context of dating violence. But what you have in cases like New Jersey, for example, are really, really strict criminal penalties as a result of Tyler Clemente, which often brings sort of, you know, this sort of like rhetoric of pipelines to prison. And sort of rather than allowing for this, um, <coughs> developmental stage for young people like to sort of make mistakes and sort of find their way and have things be real, right? Bullying is real. Hate crimes, for me, I think are actually quite real. Um, the penalties around that, I think, are problematic. Um, but allowing that space for people to grow, and we've all had in this sort of prison industrial complex model, is that it doesn't allow people to grow, right? I would rather, you know, for me, I would think that like a lifetime of, and maybe this is sort of my, you know, whatever, lefty, like a lifetime of like, therapy and community service versus like locked in a prison for the rest of your life might have more of an impact. You know, and all those things, you know, obviously have to wait to get sort of victims and victims' families and those statements. But you find this sort of like the binary structures through which the legal system operate can sort of infiltrate and influence how stories are told and how how poorly we respond to society to the gray areas in which someone might be a perpetrator but also might be a person of color may have a learning disability, might have grown up in poverty, and might have been an abuse victim as a child themselves, right? So you have all these things that are weighing out that, you know, again, when the DA is telling that story, it's like, this person is an animal, right? Mm -hmm. so. Which is also racialized. Yeah. Class. And I think it's $42,000 a year to keep someone in a New York State prison as an adult, and $260,000 a year to keep a youth in prison per year, which I think would uh, cover some therapist salary for <laughs> person. <laughs> Um, and there were some people over here that were being asked, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the other thing that was uh, thinking about the legality, I wish somebody was here from Land of Lincoln to jump in with this. Um, but the, how, do we shift, how do we shift the conversation in the other way that, that kind of like the right to the city, the right to just justice without having to suffer more and more injustice? Like, you have to wait for the perfect murder. To, uh, uh, to get what's next, you know, to get the long list of, of rights that you deserve. Um, yeah. Which, uh, you know, it's a perfect time to bring up that uh, we're doing a site visit on June 5th, which is two Wednesdays from now. We're going to the village. <laughs> um, and uh, I set up a thing called Our Queer Lives and Spaces Project, which is for this class and whoever else wants to come. Um, and it's really cool because you can call in from your phone anywhere in the world. It'll geocode your story to our map. So LGBTQ2STSIAQ people can uh, jump in and just tell your stories. You can use the web and upload pictures and videos or whatever. But uh, we'll do. We'll just walk around. We'll talk. We'll have beers someplace. Maybe not surprising where we go, and um, <laughs> uh, to, to analyze that for sure, and um, and then also we'll have time to walk around and go anywhere you want to go and tell your stories and record them too, because it would be nice if all the stories that we have are not the, the stories of violence, right? It's there's a there's a lot of, of histories that go back and get these other stories, but even you know Chauncey's these stories of these romantic entanglements that these men were in come out of out of crime reports, right? That's that's our, our history comes from police arrest records. And that's, that's what Could you talk more about right to the city? What? Say more about right to the city. Sure. And what you mean so Henri Lefebvre in the '60s is this social theorist who I think it's worth pointing out that all of his mistresses type is work for him. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, who wasn't in the 1968 riots but looked down at them from his window but wrote a lot of brilliant things about them. 
He came up with the idea. I'm sorry. I just. What was his name again? Henri Lefebvre. Henri Lefebvre. Sarah likes my translation. He has many great, amazing, and important theories and um, ideas. Um, and one of them was the right to the city, uh, which a very brilliant, awesome man named Peter Marcusi, who's a housing scholar up at Columbia, <laughs> in his 80s, and still does open reading groups, if any of you want to join them, uh, if you know his work. Yeah. Um, he's a really radical, awesome planner. And he took up the right to the city. Um, and this is the, 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 the demand that we all have um, uh, equal access, equal rights to the city, and how we use it. And a lot of it's about the public space narrative and uh, access to transport and mm -hmm. access to healthcare and education and all those things feed into it. So it's, it's, it's a great idea and rhetoric. Um, and uh, also very much used by uh, David Harvey, who's a very great public intellectual geographer who's here at the Grad Center. Um, in fact, I can send you guys a, a link to a really great discussion of, of him and. Uh, Cindy Katz, who's a, who's a feminist Marxist geographer, talking about the right to the city. Um, and four people since, I think it's 2030, I forget what year, we're, over half of us are, I think we're all half of us are already living in cities, the world's population. You know, it's the year keeps switching around when I hear about it. Um, but most of the world pop, pop, world's population lives in cities, mm -hmm. and that will continue to grow. Um, I think yeah, it was Karen who brought up in one of the first talks of, of, of first class about you guys leaving Laramie. There aren't jobs there. Um, there isn't an economy there. Um, mm -hmm. It's all about the global city and the tech and the design industry and um, the aesthetics that Colin was working on. And those are very urban phenomena. So the right to the city is the focus because everything is moving towards these giant cities. Um, it's also a little bit about the transcendence of national borders, right? Like that that, mm. that, um, that maybe like the city is a is a space for possibilities in which like the state denies. Yeah, but that's when I talk about the Homo National Zone Pinkwashing Conference. I called it Homo Urbanism, and it was like, ooh, and I didn't really want to start a new word. But um, <laughs> Homo Nationalism is Jasbir Puar's, she's at, oh, I think she's still at Rutgers. Yeah, yeah it's Jasbir Puar's uh, uh, very smart work about um, uh, how people get enough uh, equality or enough <clears throat> rights or justice, enough. Um, and then that also depends on being very racist and, and uh, associated with some religious ideologies um, that are very much at the nation, national scale. Um, and she does a lot of uh, her work uh, with a lot of examination you know, of the photos of Abu Garab and a lot of what happened, uh, how we portray terrorism and feminizing of that, and, uh, the way we sexualize, uh, sexualize especially um, at that time. And uh, kind of my response to that, which is a very right to the city argument, was just like, if we keep talking about the nation state, I don't know how far we're going to get, you know, talking the nation state. But what we do every day in our cities, like there, there are different scales we live at. You know, what we do in our home is different than what we do in our city or relates to. Um, and then what happens to nation state is different. So we can respond and reply in cities. Um, and that's why Occupy worked at the city level. You know, it was Occupy Seattle, Occupy Baltimore. Occupy Moscow, like they, it was about a city thing, you know, it was really about the cities and the the cities. Just an additional idea of the gay neighborhood as a neighborhood for the week that's been around for 25 years is the term. But the idea that the minute you do make a claim as queer space, you're also delimiting that space. And there's a really interesting tension that we haven't mentioned, which is what I read was most shocking was, yeah, of course, it was, you know, <laughs> Stonewall, but kudos to the Times and everyone else. But to me, I mean, did everyone, you know, did everyone's heart skip a beat when you read the, and he took out a gun and he shot him in the face? And so the <laughs> idea of the neighborhood to me is also delimiting space in terms of what we don't want. And there's a really implicit tension that I think that we need to get right with acknowledging, which is what kinds of, if we don't want it necessarily to be in Lefebvre's rightist rhetoric, um, you know, what kinds of tensions do we have to discuss between right of access, bodies and space, queerness, and sex in our places, 
to um, hello, walking down the street with a gun. And I think that there's a really profound tension there, which is that these articles could just as fairly be written as one man of color took out a gun and shot another man of color in the face. Oh, and by the way, it was in the village. That would just be as fair of an article. But when you superordinate it as outside Stonewall, that becomes the meta framework for how we look at that incident as opposed to the guy was walking down the village with a gun in his pocket. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> you know. And so um, queers this week haven't really taken that up. One of the things that about articles to me that speaks to these things are the different ways um, ownership gets defined by different communities in different places. Um, the stuff about like Mbaziani's piece about rural property ownership as a kind of basis for neighborhood mm -hmm. versus lesbians in Fresh Slope. Feeling a kind of ownership of the neighborhood without literal ownership, and then what really brought together these in the Mellons of Peace and talks about the, the, the voguing queens on the piers who felt they lost their sense of ownership once gentrification sort of happened. And what was interesting to me is that ownership gets narrated in a whole range of ways that are not necessarily dependent on the legal. But on the other hand, ownership always kind of implies an exclusion of one form or another. And so there's always this kind of inherent tension. It can't just be open right of access to the city for everyone, and I'm not sure that's really possible. There are always, it seems to me, these struggles over who, what kinds of people have access to which spaces on which terms. Right. Mm -hmm. So that our structural inequalities lead to all these other structures. Yeah, I need to ask that. What, what is the line um, where right to the city becomes a problematic form of ownership or claim? Um, and when does, when's the claim okay? And mean, you know, something positive or productive? Or, you know, then negative and productive too? And, and how, you know, where does that stand? And obviously, in different context. So, you know, how do you kind of come to that? I was just thinking, why are we all, why did we want all these neighborhoods anyway? What was the neighborhood thing? Why did we stop there? What was that about? You know, why were we, why was the enclave enough? Because that's that's as much as we could get. That was that was that was the dream, I would think, in this I, in this like that you would have a neighborhood that you were safe in. I would think that that you know that was that that's what is written about. this, like how we talk about social movements in the seventies. That was you know to to have an actual place where you could live and work. That that was amazing. But why doesn't that shift now? You know, as if the gay birds are just playing. I, don't know, I was kind of thinking about that one and this in this Bazzani piece when he he's saying like you know most people are so many people are saying that they don't want to live in like a gay ghetto but a lot of these like gay neighborhoods aren't like a ghetto at all now you know but um but um I don't know I think that there's so much stuff like in like queer and dyke culture about like oh like you know I'm not one of those types that like listens to Ani or like goes to a fucking parade or like I'm not one of those gays that like. You know, and, and there's, I don't know if, it, like, if that's like internalized like self-hatred or something, or if there's a lot of like, like just like neoliberalism and capitalism making it so like we have to be these like little unique individual snowflakes and not part of this like group that we have to conform, but we also have to have something that's like really different from everyone else. And so I think there might be like some of that like in our psychology about like not like really wanting like a queer space, but not wanting to be like one of the, you know, like that, I don't know, like, I don't know. Like, or something like this place is. Like, I don't know if that's if that's something, but I, I think that there's um I, I like there were a couple of quotes in this like that, I guess this piece of really devolved stories <coughs> and, and I think that um kind of who is like saying that like you know there's a portion of our community that wants to be separatists, have a queer culture, but most of us just want to be treated like everyone else. We want to be the neighbors next door, not the gay or lesbian couple next door, and it's like Okay, so if if there's a, like you can't have a queer culture and also have safety and opportunity, like those things are like totally like different <clears throat> ideas, you know. And I don't know, I don't, um, I don't know like, what's happening in people's minds necessarily when they when they want to like disassociate when people don't feel the need for like queer space anymore, like, um, and not that queer, not like queer space like the village offer space. I I mean, I'm sure lots of people in this room are with me in this sense. Like, I just, I heard about all these times like where where they're happening, like I wasn't shocked at all. Like it was just like, oh, this sucks. 
you know, but I was like, I wasn't like, oh my God, in the West Village, in Midtown, like, yeah, that shit, like, I think we know this stuff happens, you know, and I don't know if there's part of it that's like, you know, it's like, like figuring out that intent that you guys were talking about, like, like you're sort of projecting intent into someone else's mind versus like some of this like larger pay, like, well, like you've been able to get married all over the place in the last couple of weeks, so people mm. like getting pissed off at your people <clears> walking <throat> around, and, you know, um, and that's like part of it. I, um, and, and and like more queer neighborhoods are sort of. I don't know. I I, I really I find this a problem. Yeah, I, 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 there, I thought there were some serious gaps in the Gaziani, and one of them uh, is it's a very is tiny piece. yeah. Well, <laughs> so, so yeah. Um, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about my it's neighborhood. Got a whole book that I recommend. Okay, well, I, I will go find the book. It's totally yeah. it, my neighborhood is is um, marketed by real estate agents to gay couples. Where? In South Orange and Maplewood, New Jersey, right? Very seriously. And, and Montclair is the other one. Live, right? And they, <laughs> but if you think about it, it's a different mix of local services. And frankly, I don't think single gay people are particularly welcome in South Orange and Maplewood. But if you want other couples for play dates and sharing of various kinds, you want to make sure there are people who don't freak out without gay couples, because that's one of the that I mean that triggers all kinds of associations. So so people move out of the city. But one subset of them are moving to gay friendly suburbs because they're looking for a different kind of neighborhood. I think gay men, I won't speak less gays, often move into uh, gay neighborhoods partly for safety but also for the commerce. Because you would have bars or pickups or uh, uh, other kind of bookstores. Mantiques. Well, <laughs> what, whatever. It's a store of puppets, really. So, <laughs> yeah, you can fit a lot of antiques into your Manhattan apartment. Yeah. So, so there, there are other kinds. Yeah, actually, gay men move to the suburbs for the housing. For the, you know, this sounds terribly stereotypical, and certainly not always not true of everybody. So, so I mean, then there was this huge racial gap in here too. It's, it's, it's which, which, which really bothered me. But I wanted, I wanted to point out that I think there's very much a segregation. You don't see real estate agents in Bloomfield or Nutley courting gay couples to move from. To, out to, out, or I'm sure there's similar things in Long Island. Though. I think also there's a, um, in the Gizani, there's a, um, an expectation of choice, you know, the ability to move. And I was like, wow, I just never thought about that. Um, so, yes, yeah. Um, it's sort of involved. It's something that came up a lot in the coverage of Mark Carson was the, the thing of the, the angry murderer versus the person who just wanted to be who he was. And I think that sort of is playing out in a lot of these neighborhoods. The idea there, we have this vision of, the village as being a place where you go to be free. It's historically <laughs> supposed to be that. Um, and you move to the suburbs because you want to a vision. Uh, so you, you're, the people who are moving to the suburbs because they want to normalize, <coughs> they're choosing that as the place to be who they are. It's about pursuit of happiness and American self-determination. And if you have a place to go to where you can locate that, you found a solution to all the things that go with self-identification. Yeah, yeah. So um, like another old anecdote about neighborhoods. Um, my great aunt, like her big feather in her cap is that she claims to have started the Hampton Bay scene. By, because in the- Just that. Um, Art <laughs> Smith. By the way, she's having a reading on June 5th in the <laughs> Market Library, and I just oh, finished the, pre the press release for it. So she, um, she was vice president of Mattachine Society of New York, and she decided uh, for her own set of reasons that she wanted to move to Long Island. And so she left her $17 a month apartment in the West Village, which uh, I can't explain. What, <laughs> yeah, she had to explain to me what a cold water flat was. And yeah. Yeah, this was the like 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 Yeah, 17 two digit. Yeah, like she, she, she's never paid a three-digit rent or a four-digit rent until until now that she's in senior housing, but um, but that's subsidized. So she's um, so I mean, but you know, seventeen dollars in the fifties for a woman was not like an easy amount of money to get. You know, it's like uh, so like the power purchasing power change, but um, so 
she uh, so she brought out these like wealthy, empowered white corporate gay people out to Long Island and showed them like this fabulous housing stock in the Hamptons that was in the old abandoned whaling town of Sag Harbor, away from the beach. Because the mansions are along the beach, like Grey Gardens and all that. That's a very thin strip of mansions along the beachfront. There's a whole backside of the Hamptons. And then there's also the, the North Shore now, which is now the new part that's being developed. So she brought out like a, a, a carload of, uh, of like, Antique dealers and art, you know, and you know, art, um, like mad men, gay types from like uh, the Upper East Side or sorry, uh, Midtown East, which at that point was like an affluent gay neighborhood. The village was kind of a dump. So, and they just, just and they like I think the, the next day started making bids on houses and flipping them, and and so like. The first like lesbian coffee shop, the first arts store, it like were all people that she knew in uh, you, Sand Harbor. You can even trace it to Park Slope. I know somebody who did a dissertation yeah. on that. And there was one family who uh, a lot of the brownstones were slated to be torn down and built into public housing. Um, kind of like First Street to Ninth Street. Like at some point that was going to be torn down and turned into public housing. And there was like one straight couple though who went around and was like would bring people out when it would have all these house parties like look you could buy these so cheap um rallying around kind of saving that housing oh, oh wait so to finish that thought so now in the area that in the hamptons where you where, where, where people tell you that they live in the hamptons typically unless they're like unless they're people who own a 10 million dollar plus house is either Sag harbor or it's the woods which is like what was farmland and, and forests in between the beachfront and the mm -hmm. town of Sag Harbor. And so it's kind of weird whenever I get invited out to people's stuff and, you know, to, 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 for the weekend with like, uh, or, or I get told of people who go out to the Hamptons on the weekend ask where specifically, they say, oh, the Hamptons. They say, no, what's the address? I know the Hamptons pretty well. <laughs> so they, like, and then like, I, and then I say, have you ever heard my last name before? And they're like, oh no, I heard about those two witches in that house. And, the, and so it's like, it's weird. Cause like now the like, the first gays that got to the Hamptons ha have this like, uh, have have this like dilapidated house they've been suing each other over and so it's like this uh, like this weird decline thing to where like it's the, a yeah it's this weird yeah. s uh, switch which like uh, the Jews that I that, that I that I've met that have been my clients that live in Hamptons like you know they the, I I tell them what like what my last name is and they say oh from the Hamptons oh no and then I say. You know that you know those are Holocaust survivors you're talking about. And they like they're shocked. They have no idea. And then the gay that's associated with her is like it's really strange the way this dynamic um, has like this isolation has sort of taken hold. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Um, in response to Bill's comment, and it also brings back on what Colleen was saying about um, hate crimes and this kind of neoliberal moment propelling um, this sense of freedom and equality. Um, and using that as kind of a just underlying force of, you know, this is what we really are striving for and, and want this idea of freedom and to be, you know, to function freely in, in spaces. And when, you know, what actually is propelling um, that whole narrative is a structural inequality that is produced and reproduced. And I don't think we're as critical about that as in. I'm just going to throw this out. I, mean, I was at a demonstration the other night, and I grew up in that neighborhood. And what really struck me is kind of ironic and interesting is that the shrine for Mark Carson was in the doorway of the old Barnes and Noble, which no longer exists. And I remember when that closed in December, I was really sad. You know, I said, this is really sad. The village can't even support a Barnes and Noble anymore. There's only one inside Union Square. There's a lot of master places closed. And you know, so it was sort of like the building was in this shroud of, of brown wrapping paper, which it still has, and there's still nothing in there. And then the shrine was like just right in the doorway, like almost like the wrapping paper was sort of like part of it. It was just very weird. The, the, the juxtaposition of the shrine and the, and the closed store. I mean, the store is big. It takes up the whole corner. And it, it's also strange that, you know, it's there's nothing in there. I don't know what's coming, but I mean, it's been empty since December. And so it was just sort of like, it was, it was just ironic. It was just, uh, 
nestled in there in the doorway, the old parts of the other. It's just too old on the HP, all, they're all big and spin. Right, right, right. Yeah, right. it's like there was a different light, and then, of course, mm -hmm. Oscar Wilde, Oscar Wilde, Wilde and then, yeah. you know, it, and a lot that came out in my research was how exciting it was to have a shelf at Barnes & Noble mm -hmm. in the 90s. Right. Oh, wow. It was easy. Um, and Barnes Noble, this is a great accomplishment. Um, and then to have that even gone to like to absent the shelf or the, the shelves. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. It's interesting because when I think about like sort of gay neighborhoods, it's like one thing to have like a gay coffee shop, but it's another thing to have like eight Mark Jacobs and like a five Mark Rachel's. <laughs> and so at one time it's gonna become this sort of like you know, overkill. And with respect to gay bookstores, so that one is that I'm close, but there is that pop up bookstore in the Lower East Side, the the Bureau of General Services with Blue Vision, and they actually have some good stuff. So I want to do And there's Blue Stock. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Blue Stockings, which is more like, I think it's more radical and lefty. But, but it's, we've got a lot of stuff. stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I guess that the point that I wanted to make was thinking about sort of when queer cities develop and people move out to the suburbs <laughs> and thinking about how even if you move out into the suburbs, there's like, I guess I'm just thinking about, I'm sorry, my point is actually about undiscovered queer neighborhoods in New York. And so I'm from I mean, out myself as born and raised and current resident of Staten Island, right? And I work, I'm like on the board of the Staten Island LGBT Center. And you have all of these, like you have this really interesting generational divide where there's sort of two large groups that go there. So people say from like 25 to 55 don't really occupy that center. It's often a space where um, young queer kids um, under 25 go to collect. And then you have basically people who are in the closet like for most of their lives are now utilizing the center, right? And for like 50 plus. And so it's really interesting to have this like, there's definitely a racial divide where most of the kids who use the center are like people of color. And most of the people who are able to kind of like contribute to those spaces are white people who are able to contribute. And so I've been trying to bring this sort of like critical race analysis around them. They're all minimal, but they have different values, different language, and different um, sort of ways of communicating. And so I just wanted to bring that up because I think that even in the sort of larger fabric of the stories, of the Park Slopes and the Jackson Heights. They're like pockets of really interesting things that are going on around the city. And so, and how they organize around that. So for example, I was talking to one of the workers at the center and I was talking about how after they had this like youth drag competition two weeks ago, which was amazing and the kids were really talented and you should all go. Anyway, I was talking to them about how they all get home afterwards, right? So you have all these like kids who are like under 20, like many of them dressed in drag and you know, use like blowed up condoms to like, as like breasts, you know? Um, and they were walking around the streets and I asked the worker, I was like, don't you worry about them going home? And she's like, I worry about them every night, but they travel in packs. And so, like, although they're like dressed up, you know, sort of in drag or whatever it is they're wearing, they're pretty fabulous, they like sort of keep an eye out for each other. And so I just wanted to raise that because I think that there are queer neighborhoods, even conservative places, probably in New Jersey. And there's other ways where people are sort of naturally organizing and coming together that aren't Mark Jacobs or a different light or, you know, whatever, the hate queen parties. You know, there's like all these young things that are happening, so. Yeah, yeah that's something else that reminds me of this um, quote that came out of my research that there's this group from the, who had come out in the early 80s was talking and they said, oh yeah, I still see those kids hanging out from the center. And it's like, those kids have been hanging out from the center since the center opened in 1983, right? So, and um, maybe you have done some of them. Um, Something else that came up to me is we're always talking about these queer homeless youth of color. Why do they have? Why do we all only concerned about the most uh, oppressed, uh, economically screwed group of people? You know, like it's. It, we keep coming back to that, but the, that point that Amelia makes is that we're we're all suffering from this. Mm -hmm. You know, the suppression affects all of us, um, and some in very different ways than others. Um, but instead of creating the solidarity, where there's a lot of talk. Um, and attention, finally, to queer homeless youth of color. So I wanted to, to raise that too about how this permeates all of our lives and how those, again, these are, inter, these are interwoven. And um, I had that, I think, was a really great point that the structural quality is attached to that structural quality. You know, we're not going to get one of those without the other. So I wouldn't miss where you want to I also thought it was so weird that Barnes and Noble was like right in front of Barnes and Noble. And, and I was thinking about the empty shelf. I was, you know, uh, as it was such a, it was so important. The Barnes and Noble was so important. 
There used to be three straight blocks of classy bookshops mm -hmm. before Barnes & Noble was even down there. And now the only bookstore is left, or the only book commerce left there are the homeless people selling the books. Yeah. The great and it's book like Dollar Pizza. The great bookshop was the 8th Street bookstore, yeah. which closed in the early 70s. And then two stores opened everywhere. 8th Street Shasta. I don't think there's any shoe stores there anymore. Yeah, there's I mean, yeah. 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 Your urban <laughs> have, have people seen this WNYC map of um, like it's literally purple? Uh, it's like where the concentration of from this 2010 census where the concentration of gay couples are. Oh, where are we? Let's get to the north. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, the, if you guys remember filling out the census, it didn't ask your sexuality, but it did ask if you were like in a same, uh, same sex partnership. So, this isn't like the census for where all gay people live necessarily, but if you are in a couple, you are um, in this map. Um, so I don't know, I think it's in 2010. In 2010, right. yeah, 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 totally. Um, but it, I, it, you made me think of it because um, because the sort of hidden, sort of hidden or undiscovered gay places or whatever, um, I, for example, as a, I'm, I'm totally old school, as in the Ani, I go to the parade, you know, I choose to live in a gay neighborhood proudly, um, I lived in one neighborhood, I moved to another, you know, um, but I was expecting Jackson Heights to be purpler than it is, um, and then there are some other places that were supposed to be purple, like maybe this part of, like, East New York. What are the purple snaggers? Well, I will just hand yeah, it right say, over. Well, I wanted to say the Williams Institute published a... They do a lot. If you don't know, it's just it's got great stuff. Sure. But uh, they looked at that data and where in major cities and minor cities are the highest concentrations of same-sex couples, and they're in the most conservative places. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's from gay couples raising families. Yes. Which is even more interesting. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's it's an older social structure. Mm -hmm. Oh no! I just uh, retweeted the address to the um, or the link to the, oh, to yeah, the map, yeah. so it's Thank all. One thing I was wondering about if it would explain the Jackson Heights perk would be what, what the denominator was. Was it population or is it households? But it is household that's on the bottom. So it's the percentage of households mm -hmm. that are headed by a same sex couple. So you should, you know, really take it. There's also, uh, you know, and I, I think something uh, like a lot of response to that about the household thing is like men who are on the DL and go out and hook up with other men or have relationships outside of the house. but. Um, for peer appearances, keep up the white from the kids and things like that. So that shifts who's, who has the privilege and the class racial support to, to, to do that. I mean, we see this with coupling in general, different sex also, right? That <coughs> they marriage further, it's because they're living at home longer, because they can't afford to. Mm -hmm. so. And New York, I think, what is the average age of marriage? Is something in the late 30s mm -hmm. now or something? Is there an average age of marriage even? <laughs> Um, and people mostly keep their apartments, yeah, just in case, you know. <laughs> what are you seeing, by the way? Can you share? What are you seeing? Me? Yes, because you're seeing. Uh, well, just that there's something very strange about this. Like, one of the purplest areas is the Brooklyn Navy Yards, which I know, <laughs> and no one lives there. It's all it takes is one gate <laughs> Um, and then I live really close to there, and it's like sort of purple. And then there's this um, triangle right where now the Barclay Center is that is super purple, mm -hmm. also. So, as if like gay couples live like directly in the mall. <laughs> <laughs> it's, They're gone. It's, um, it, I just find that really strange. This is all about Brooklyn, is the, that's the part that I find. There's nothing else from purple. Chelsea is well, very Chelsea purple. is really purple. Yeah, yeah. no, Manhattan is lots of purple. <laughs> right, exactly. And then, like in the Bronx, or Staten Island. Nothing right. in the Bronx, and nothing. Well, there, no, there's some. There's some lightly purple areas of Washington Heights and the Bronx. Definitely. Definitely. And actually, the the Bronx has a um, has a large gay population, especially gay families. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's probably representative. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think that you're onto something, Rebecca, because um, if you click, I don't know if you can do that on that device, but if you do it on the computer, you can actually click every little uh, map and it will show you numbers. And mm -hmm. the Navy Yards has 74 couples um, in total, all, oh, in total. all yeah. overall, where if you go one, 
if you go to Dumbo, you have 981 couples. So obviously the selection is going to be. Really good. Um, there's also like a lot of like like what makes a gay neighborhood and, and who has the money behind it. I mean, the beatnik yeah. reputation and the kind of wild, um, uh, I guess the reputation that mm -hmm. for the for the for Greenwich Village uh, supported that kind of LGBTQ identity or space to be there like that. But something like Dumbo, I mean, you've seen the Watchtower buildings. Um, and there are a lot of stores that aren't allowed to 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 go in there because they're it's owned by Jehovah's Witnesses. And all Forbidden, they sold like some of buildings. They're leaving. They're leaving. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I mean, they bought a big, right? And there's a big developer who bought, I think, most of the two trees. Yeah, yeah. So that neighborhood will see massively shifted. I wouldn't be surprised to see some big gay in there. Um, but do you think neighborhoods are still useful? Neighborhoods are still useful. Chelsea's pretty gay. You know, yeah. It's gay. It's gay. It's weird because, like, I live in, on 8th Avenue in Chelsea and I was mugged, and then, um, like, coming home late from a, a gay party in Brooklyn. And then I went, and then uh, I've also been shouted at, like, had homophobes slurs to shout at me. But then I go to, like, uh, well, like, a few years ago when it was that year, I would go to. Uh, a queer commune in Bushwick for parties, and they're like they people leave in a pack because yeah, like because everything was so unsafe in Bushwick, you know, a few years ago. So I was, I was actually I think of the is the neighborhood important and is neighborhood still exists and all this stuff in the for context of gay bars because I heard on some like I don't know some show at some point that gay bars were actually on the same list of businesses in danger that video stores were once on. Um, and they kind of like talked about how gay bars were, um, were, were falling. Like the, the, the need for gay bars was becoming diminished uh, because of the tendency of homosexuals to assimilate or to just hang out with their accepting straight friends. Or use grinder. Or, or use grinder. <laughs> Or like all these other sorts of things, and this has actually struck me as really weird because I live in Brooklyn and I go to gay bars all the time. <laughs> and so I was just like, and so I sometimes I look around and I'm like, oh, what is what does it mean for me to go to a gay bar? Like, why do I go to a gay bar as opposed to the tavern next door or something like that? Mm -hmm. And in part because I want to talk about penises or you know, <laughs> like top and bottoming and you know like my friend, what kind of things my friends are doing. Not these guys, so. <laughs> uh, but but um, but just those sorts of things, and it's just like, and I feel like, in the same sort of way, it's like it's it feels easier to talk um, in gay bars about those sorts of things, and it might just go easier to be a uh, same sex couple with kids in some place where that's more common too, and um, yeah. Seems like maybe in a big city, the idea of a gay neighborhood is more important than the actual physical location, like in the Hartsup article about how like. We all know people that live in parts of maybe, but you know, I only know one place that lives in parts of. It's like this lesbian mecca, but who lives there? I don't know anyone lives there. And so <laughs> like maybe knowing that we have these gay spaces and that there are these gay neighborhoods is more important than like actually existing in them. Um, mm -hmm. As like a mm -hmm. yeah. you, you want to say something? And what leaps out to me as being potentially important about neighborhoods the role it played for me coming out in the early 90s, which was being young and wanting to find out you know, how to be gay and be taught. <laughs> and that's what you did. You went to the neighborhood to, to do that, right? And and I do think, you know, even in the utopian world that we're all putting headed towards where there's no heterosexism anymore, <laughs> there will still be a need. <laughs> and that was sarcastic. Right, right, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, <clears throat> There'll still be a need for kind of socialization into a kind of community and ways of life, including very practical information about sex, et cetera. And I honestly don't know because I'm ancient, approaching 40 now. Like, has online, are online spaces doing that for kids now? Could you imagine learning about what sex is through Grindr and how, like that many characters, <laughs> like no mask, no mask, you know, only mask, man, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. That's crazy. Or Craigslist, the Craigslist guys we talked about. 
I think I think that the idea of of neighborhoods is really in in our own imagination in so many ways. Like I think that there's a lot of people that would like not think of Bedstuy as a really queer neighborhood, but since so many of my friends are in Bedstuy, then I feel like oh, but to me that's this neighborhood and and so many more. Kensington, you know, and and I think that um, but it's weird how it's like queer homes are the ways that I think of the queer homes, like residences, are the are the like physical space that you can think of it as a neighborhood rather than like Chelsea, like you know, the middle of village and the gay business at making it think of like those things. So. Um, and like, what is the difference between a gay neighborhood that's maybe not primarily gay, like Chelsea or the West Hills, but that has like a high concentration of queer homes? And like, how does that act differently than than a bunch of gay businesses? And like, how can people be like uh, queer, like eyes and ears of the neighborhood from a home space or the, the residential space? And I think we're seeing that happen more and more. I feel like everyone, no one does it anymore and everyone does it like everyone does That's a very, in your perspective, your perspective, there's like a gender narrative too. Like I don't want to reward one of your genders. Yeah. But um, there's yeah. also, uh, from what you said in the past, but there's also an expectation that what we'll get is that imaginary, like, out of that I'm not going to be that a queer trans. That, um, or, or what you'll get is that, you know, like that's, that's what we have in the With the three bars, this, you know, to come out, to go to Manhattan, San mm-hmm. Rio, uh, and and no. Oh, that brand new Lesbian and fly. Yeah. Lesbian and fly, actually. That's what it's not actually a lesbian, but it's lesbian and fly. Because yeah. the owners are lesbians. Yeah. Um, well, being from Toronto, I think mean, we have one gay area. Like, mm-hmm. We call it the gay area. The church and the village. The village, yeah. yeah. And um, that's where our community center is. Like, it's really fantastic things. Um, we can go to the city. And without the myth of the gay village, people wouldn't know where to go, right? Um, and so when I moved to Toronto when I was 19, I guess, knowing that Parkdale was like the young queer crowd, that was a way to integrate and just learn the people I So I think uh, the ideas of it are really important. And the Toronto stories are very different, but um, really cool. And Catherine Nash is from Catherine to see Nash is back in Toronto. Um, something that has, I don't think it's come up yet, um, but I think it's important about bars becoming like gay or queer spaces uh, is addiction. I mean, addiction in general, yeah. and um, in particular, something I learned about uh, last year, which is a cycle of funding that happens with alcohol and tobacco companies who actually put a lot of money into conservative law and homophobic lobbying and then also market themselves as like you know sponsored pride or whatever so that they can continue the cycle of oppression leading to addiction leading to you know oppression leading to addiction and continue to make money off of that cycle Really good point. Um, I, I, um, not that I don't know if anybody else, you might have just read them for 25 years, but I went back and read 25 years of lesbian publications, and I actually went up being obsessed with the ads because you can see, like, in the 1980s, there's like one, there's one person who's actually photographed in her ad, her ad, right? She's the guitarist, she's an acoustic guitarist. And I was like, oh, that's sweet. She plays parties. And then there's a lot of just like a number with no address for a lot of places or businesses. And then you see addresses start and people start to show up in the ads and then all of a sudden it's just, in 1992, everything goes glossy and then for men it's like around 1990, it goes glossy magazines, it's alcohol. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that started uh, because of Absolute, really, that that oh, yeah. kind of started. So the first issue of the advocate, Keith Herring, who designed the Absolute ad on the back ad and gay men went to that San Francisco gay men went to bars, and this is in the Vocomo Economics, and refused any other alcohol, and it like for, for weeks until they just threw it away and bought only Absolute. Um, and there were a lot of boycotts at the time, and there was the, the, the buy gay and how gay for buying was really transformative, and every other, you know, story, et cetera, uh, jumped on the bandwagon, and you could just see that for years, and now it's travel. You know, travel really took off in the 2000s, too. Um, 
big realization that we have to go on vacation somewhere um, <laughs> that can be marketed as safe. And, but there, there's somebody else in the room. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I think I remember there a couple of years ago there was a poster um, up in um, Calendar that it was for. Um, I forgot what tobacco company, but it said something like, they don't support us, why should we support them? Or something like that. Another interesting yeah. note about the, um, the bars, I uh, used to work as a go-go dancer in the um, Lower East Side um, a couple of years ago. And um, I used to like eat fire, I'd love to land uh, And we used to get like our biggest business when the economy was shit. Um, like it was, it was kind of like great because everyone like goes out and tries to feel better and whatever. So I'm just wondering if it's an economic thing right now if bars are kind of um, not doing too well, which might mean maybe the economy is better. And, yeah, mm -hmm. Other than drinking at home because they can't afford it. That was one of the that was one of the ways in which a male bar scene. Like in the West Chelsea, before Chelsea became gay, particularly the weather scene, uh, it was the decay of New York in the 60s and 70s made mm -hmm. a space that allowed gay people uh, to act. And it's not part of the story you ever hear, yeah. but as the city was declining, the gay economy and gay world was expanding rapidly. Because it could afford it. Yeah, and yeah, of course, and of course you come into, I and mean, there's these ironies, and one of the reasons, one of the ways in which a lot of gay spaces disappeared was precisely because of Jane Jacobs. And I admire what she said, I admire immensely. Yes. But I mean, because she found ways, you know, the small buildings, <coughs> empty spaces, all of, a lot of gay spaces disappeared, mm -hmm. especially the notorious trucks. Yeah. What notorious trucks? Uh, there, was a whole, <laughs> there was a whole area of the West Village that was um, trucking uh, concerns. And at night, they became gay. Putin's spot, okay, sex spot. Uh, up till 1973 or four, when those all those little small sized buildings were put up, which is a good idea in one sense, but it's funny irony. Right, right. And, then, and this neighborhood thing is supposed to mimic small town life, which you found so infuriating, yeah. right? Because it, it's not a town. She was like, it's a city. It's a city. It's supposed to be about difference. It's not like we're all supposed to be homogeneous. Mm -hmm. Like, don't attach to the neighborhood. Back then, anymore. Yeah. Um, so I feel really attached to the wars too, but I think that one that of the things that's so interesting about them is that they have a literal gatekeeper, right? Like unlike some of the other first spaces, like what you write about of spaces that can be presumed lesbian queer. And uh, the most recent time that I was at Gender Gingers, the um, bouncer stopped me and said, "Do you know this is a lesbian bar?" Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> "I really do." <laughs> And she looked me up and down and said, Welcome to the family. Um, and I was like, well, pressure, because I just sort of wanted to be like, I have been queer, I have been fucking women for 17 years. <laughs> How dare you? Um, and uh, but I thought that was, I was just thinking about that. Like, I feel so attached to it, but it's there is a little gatekeeper versus like other parts of Park Slope where. Um, like I thought it was interesting that the Parks of Food Co-op is in your chapter yeah. and the idea of the thickening, I love the word thickening there, the, the thickening into a lesbian queer space that it's not in any way an explicit lesbian queer space but that I feel like the way I function in the Parks of Food Co-op is to decide that everyone is queer and, and like treat everyone accordingly. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I hear women, I hear women saying I joined to, to meet girls. You know, I hear it as I walk around, oh, I just got a now can be a nice girl. I think that's an idea, that's an idea. Um, we'll get on my shit, you know. That. <laughs> that's okay. yeah. And but that, that has like a different type of gatekeeping, and certainly it's a cultural gatekeeping, but isn't a, like, I'm looking you up and down, and like, you know, I'm not sure about there. Yeah. yeah, I hope this isn't dragging the conversation back to a few minutes ago, but I was really intrigued by this notion of the, the importance of imagining that there's a neighborhood, even if you're never there. And it struck me that there's some similarity with diasporaness, right? The homeland somewhere, Israel or Armenia or wherever it is. Even if you've never been there, even if you can't trace your ancestry there, and of course, gay people don't work that way anyway, but there was this, as we tried to come to some sense of an identity, I think in the 80s there was this use of ethnicity metaphors, partly because the law would reward you if you could say I'm a discriminated against ethnicity. But that's part of it was that we must have a place 
where we belong. And I, I actually think that helps people identify as gay, even if none of the networking or commerce or sexual cruising goes on, that somehow there's there's a place, there's a place for us. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, yeah. That's a very American idea. Like I just want to jump in. Well, it's Jewish. It's right. Well, it is, but it's also the American manifest destiny idea that there that we will keep going and taking spaces and finding yeah. spaces. And there's a space for everyone in this difference, and then the difference gets much accentuated. Yeah, um, I don't want to divide our community anymore. Then. I feel like it is, but there's. Um, I thought it was a really interesting thing. This class is from queer in New York, right? Not like LGBT in New York. Um, <laughs> and in, um, I know that there's a lot of discussion about like the um, normalizing or the come out of danger or the HRC people and then us crazy queers. And I, I, I think that there's this, um, I think that it's blank that we're conflating them. Like there's something interesting that uh, we're able to say LGBTQ, right, queering neighborhoods. When I think about neighborhoods, I think of definitely kind of like a spatial space, but when I think about the queer community, I'm also thinking about uh, my friends in San Francisco and um, you know uh, people in Canada and you know and so I don't know I think I, I think yeah there's definitely something about knowing that oh well you know if you know if people take over Brooklyn well at least we have San Francisco or like that imagine kind of like spaces for Community. Thomas will say, home is where when you go there, they have to take you in. Yeah, kind of similar to what you're saying, I just wanted to add that um, I think like all this, I was really fascinated by everything, everything we read and all this um, ideas about neighborhoods are really important to me, but I don't feel relatively young and 23 trans and queer person, I don't feel a pull towards neighborhoods or gay spaces or lesbian spaces. Um, I don't feel like I, I'm safe there. Um, it's a little bit different with queer spaces. Um, I mean, obviously trans spaces are like a whole other thing. Um, but although I think, you know, a lot of trans people do feel safer in gay or queer spaces than they do in mainstream society and straight spaces, which is, you know, everywhere, whatever. Um, I think it's really a different, I have a different relationship to, like, these sections. You know, we're talking about people who don't have neighborhood. Like, there's no trans neighborhood. Although, I, you know, I do see the relationships between trans trans people and queer people and gay people. Um, I think a lot of overlap and evolution there, but not that. Uh, the largest population of trans people live in Jackson Heights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that another what? group you always see Where did that No, mm -hmm. no from, from um, I will find you two sources, mm -hmm. not just one, I want you to Um <laughs> One is, uh, the um, the trans organization that is in the LGBT community center in Jackson Heights, like they have like sort of talked about it publicly, um, and the other is maybe um, when a few years ago when I forget which gay organization was some gay organization and make the Rose New York published um, these documents about how the other oh, transgender warrior reflected the war yeah there you go. And they um, were publishing uh, a bunch of information about how the trans community of color, which is primarily of color in Jackson Heights, were being disproportionately affected by stop and frisk. There were some numbers that came out of that. Almost so I wouldn't call said. it I wouldn't call it a trans neighborhood certainly, but that is like where many trans people, especially trans people of color, live. And the, that idea of a trans neighborhood is really worth like holding on to. Because we can imagine the lesbian, we can imagine the gay neighborhood, but why 
Why can't, why haven't we yet? And what, I, I don't want to forget a bisexual neighbor. That would be awesome. You know, bisexuals would be really happy with um, Why do they have to be one way or the other? You know, how many times do they have to deal with that question forever? So, um, so like, um, on the conversation of gay bars and advertising, I thought it was really fascinating that someone brought up the alcohol funding cycle. Dude, I thought that was a core specific thing, but you know, like it's interesting to know that the whole, whole industry functions under that paradigm. Mm -hmm. But um, if you look, like in the New York Public Library Medishine archives, like the biggest amount of records that they have, other than these like, you know, 12 page longhand letters that these queens would write to one another, because like they would do that back then, um, is their accounting records of who paid dues, who would actually have their names in as a member versus so the same. people who <laughs> anonymously gave you know, the five dollars. And these accounting records are, are separated between the society and the Mattachine Review, the newsletter. Uh, and the newsletter uh, had all this correspondence with the ownership of Julius that would never advertise oh. and, and uh, try to like threaten to sue them for claiming that Julius was a gay bar. <laughs> and uh, whereas Pieces in the 60s, uh, under the, fir the first time that Pieces opened, um, was, uh, you know, uh, advertised in Madison Review. And so that was a big flag thing, because that was sort of the only node for communication for the gay community in the, in the late 50s, early 60s. <clears throat> and then um, they came up with, um, and, and so then, like, uh, from there I started reading up the other gay bars. Like, did, did you guys know that St the Stonewall Inn was closed from, like, 1970 until the 1990s? Like, yes. that, and that's only half the building. Like, mm -hmm. the bar was twice as big as it, as it is now. I, I thought that was fascinating. Mm -hmm. That, like, this thing is just actually a reproduction, and it's like a total packaging of our history. Right, yeah. Clinton made a historic site. Was it 94? 94. <laughs> And so that, but it was it was going to be. I think it might have been torn down. So that was part of the that part of it became claimed as a historic site. The little thing is on the building, um, and then it was just reopened in two thousand four, two thousand five. I I, I, I uh, the Wikipedia article I thought said the nineties, but yeah, it could have been the two thousands. But that's isn't that fascinating that it's not a contiguous. Gave like it is an all of us, right? Right. That's that's the, the story. Right. The story that it continues is important, not the fact. Right. Mm -hmm. Does anyone know what the longest operating? That was the bar that just closed. Julius. 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 Lindsay, you ready to go on a comment on the history? Of course, yeah. yeah. Well, so that was the longest running bar. They were, they were open earlier. So now they were in the so well, I was thinking about Lunch Oakland that I read and celebrated like 75 or 80 years. Lunch? Like, like it's, it's it's on Telegraph Avenue in Oakland. Okay. Well, I actually, I emailed my brother about it. He's like, what's on that corner? But it's like a queer bar. Yeah, Last Call at Mods is a great documentary. Um, I love that you took it back. I mean, like, um, it's interesting coming back to the neighborhood. It's like the, like I hear the street coming up a lot, and, and you're bringing up the bar a lot, and you're bringing up the center and uh, co-op and all these kind of institutions in the city, and it's all kind of coming together in the neighborhood. Is that a hand? No. Okay, true. Yeah, I just love your uh, your phrase here, uh, produced by the practices of the everyday life. <clears throat> oh yeah, and they, and they are, um, and that's another Lefebvrean idea that we produce space and how we perceive it and conceive it and live it. Like every day, we are producing space. <coughs> What's awesome about that is how agentic it is and how we have a role in that. You know, it's not just architects and engineers and <coughs> those that um, whatever you are wearing and however you strut down the street is. <coughs> Uh, where we are. <coughs> oh, I was just going to say, I, I wanted to say something about the gay suburbs. <coughs> oh, yeah. um, so, um, my mom and her partner, like 25 years or whatever, they live or used to live in South Jersey. 
that's not where I grew up, but that's where they lived like once I went off to college. And their experience there as opposed to in downtown Philadelphia for many years was like very, very different. But they actually like created way more of a gay community once they moved to the suburbs. <laughs> um, I think because people were hungry for each other in a way that they weren't in Philadelphia, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, I don't know, it's just, and, and for, like, when they first moved there, and before they made friends, they would be like, we saw this, speaking of everyday life, like, we saw this lesbian couple in Home Depot, I'm like, we're going to keep going there until we see them again. <laughs> You're so embarrassing. That's why I live in New York City, right? Like, so that I don't have to stalk other lesbians in Home Depot. <laughs> I looked at Berlin, and I was like, where do people be? Your bars and the equivalent of Home Depot. You're yeah. always going to meet somebody who just moved out of an apartment and is looking at you and talk her up. And I was like, Are you serious? And that was like very common. Yeah. yeah. But you have to paint your apartment when you move into a new apartment in Berlin. So you should go to the painting section. And people would go there and cruise. <laughs> <laughs> and so, where is, where is, um, you know, there, um, there's an interracial couple or whatever. But so, whereas in the art art museum neighborhood where they lived in downtown Philadelphia, and mostly everyone that lived there was white, um, in South Jersey, like they became friends with a really diverse group of gays. Um, this like Latino gay male couple that lived a few blocks away. This um, my mom was working at a public school at the time, and the uh, this other woman who worked there who's African American was like I guess one of the security guards at the school, her and her partner lived nearby. And so they like, all of a sudden they, knew, it was it was sort of like like what happens when you go to a gay bar in like a small town in the South or something and everybody's there. It's not like you're at the black lesbian bar. Like ev everybody's there because there's, cause it, you know, it's the sort of phenomena of there hardly are any, there hardly are any gays there. So everybody goes to the same place, young and old, you know? So it was that sort of phenomena where like they, um, and I've heard this from friends like, even straight friends like, oh, when I moved to like Iowa or whatever, all of a sudden I had way more diverse people in my life than when I lived in Brooklyn, you know, because there was like less opportunity to self-segregate. And so you just become friends with everyone who's down in whatever that means to you, you know. Um, so I thought that that was kind of interesting, but I, but I, something about the, so they weren't as isolated as I thought they were going to be. And so that's sort of why I'm, I'm talking about the gay suburb, right? Like, because my sort of, um, if my like what I deem as important in, in my experience of being in the city, I thought I felt really judgy about the move to the suburbs. <laughs> I was like, oh, you're gonna be so isolated. And Most the characters and then, do. And yeah, so then they and so then they weren't actually isolated, and so that was kind of interesting. <clears throat> it was interesting. Yeah. I think I just something you said. Where is everyone age 25 to 50 and queer and LGBTQ from Staten Island? Mm -hmm. Are they in the city? Are they in Manhattan? I think so. Right. They, they have like these yeah, like course. social groups to have like this women's potluck and this men's group, but it's really sparsely attended. And I think for me, I guess the way that I've analyzed that is this idea that like, sort of when you can leave Staten Island and do, right? And then certain people were able to come back and sort of establish roots there, but they were sort of, you know, they, they do that at a specific stage in your life. And sort of this, in this like queer coming of age where you do that is a way, largely away from home, right? So for home for queer people is this sort of fluid place, right? So you can, I'm sort of coming back to that now, but home for me wasn't the physical space. You know, where I got community at the same time. Right. Yeah. Larry Knopf is a geographer and he writes a lot about um, he, writes a lot, he wrote about a really interesting idea of placelessness and how placelessness plays a role in our life. And not transience, <coughs> interestingly enough, but like actual placelessness, like not having a place. Um, and he interviewed a lot of older gay men who, who felt that way, like it didn't matter if they had a name or not, that they were still places, that they still weren't supposed to belong. And how they responded. Yeah. There's one thing I what we might be worth coming back to, and that was your mentioning of Julius's, and there's a reason Julius wouldn't be advertised. And what had nothing to do, I mean, had something to do with police. Uh, right. Everybody knew Julius was a gay bar, including police, but if they said it, they'd be closed. And right, right, right. so you had that handful of people who were brave enough to advertise. Well, yeah. I, and then the debate within Mafia was, well, we're giving them all our money. Why aren't they advertising? We're giving them, besides the price of the beer, we're giving them payoff money so <laughs> that they, they don't they let us keep using the bar. Well, that sort of changed after 1970. Mm -hmm. It's a for a bar to come up. But, but uh, Mafia bars were actually fairly 
trying to read the advertisement because they take the police off. But I mean, I, I think raising the police on a historical question, it's just that sometimes the neighborhoods you become gay or anything mm -hmm. depend upon where you're allowed to be different. Yeah. Uh, and the police, and in the 60s, it was a very different world in the 70s or the 90s or the 2000s. Right, or even in the 2000s, and, and late 2000s, like passwords to get in a certain bar. So, yeah. you know, that's right. I mean, mm -hmm. What this brings to mind is it's in all the pieces that we haven't talked about a whole lot in the discussion, which is how what structures access to a lot of these spaces is not the law per se, but patterns of private ownership and what a private owner decides to do or not do. That the Barnes and Noble setting for the um, for the remembrance, right, makes sense because there's not an owner there on spot saying you can't put your candles here, right, in his doorway, right, and. You know, it is obviously part and parcel of the world, right? Mm -hmm. Free, free, free. Everyone is free to keep everyone else out, right? Right. And how that plays out is really critical. And there's different conjunctures in different moments mm -hmm. for what possibilities those create. Something, but I feel like they've been saying a lot. <laughs> Does anyone want to go first? You've all said brilliant. So, yeah. um, I, actually, so I was actually thinking again, sorry to go back to the, the hate crime, but also thinking about this as sort of issue. Like what, when we started talking about home, I started thinking about home and how we create home and how it's a construct. And so I was thinking about this in relation to hate crime and this idea that even if we construct the West Village as sort of this gay home or sort of quote unquote safe space, there's also this idea that when this sort of violence happens, like this sort of reminder that we as individuals are guaranteed nothing, right? Like nothing is a guarantee. Like any moment, and, and any one of us could have been a victim of it. If no reason we can die, our children can die, all these things. And so, like, sort of the private world tries to create these spaces where we have buildings we own, but the idea of home in these spaces is something. Much more ephemeral, right. and it's something that we to quote RuPaul thinking about how travel and existence to threat spaces and total influenced by these like sort of generational things. And so when you referenced earlier, I forgot who was this is like, so, because like Park Slope was really expensive now. Is it like in their you know signals or people who have came up when that neighborhood came up? So there's all these like blossoming spaces of home, right? But none of those places are static. Like none of those places are gonna be there forever because of, you know, sort of neoliberalism or neoliberals and capitalism. All those spaces are constantly moving, right? They're pushing out, forming different places. And so when I think about home for me, it's this like it's an imaginary place that's constructed that might have some geographic elements to it, but is really about those relationships, those memories, those people that I have that, you know, are all over the place. Right, that kind of fragmented. It's, maybe that's something that's like it, that kind of places. It's not placelessness. It's just home in a different way. And I think that that's what I want to do with this article. Instead of saying it's a bad thing that we fail. I mean, I had a lot of women in my studies say, "Oh my God, I'm such a failure to move to Park Slope, or I failed. To move, you know, I failed to go to the bar, and then it closed, and it's my fault." <laughs> oh, the socialization of gender. And I was just like, um, but when you heard 47 women say it over and over and over again, you realized that oh, it's totally made up. And <laughs> um, uh, that these that that the kind of space we want to create might not work like that, and yeah. I appreciate you saying that. Uh, do you want to say something? Um, I was going to say about um, the gay neighborhood and that Sixth Avenue and Eighth Street. I don't really feel. I live in the West Village. I, that is the West Village. I think trip. Um, um, I mean, you go ten blocks away. The only thing really queer that I have seen, and I, there are people in Arabic, um, but it's not, um, I, I mean, I, I think of it as a very commercial strip. Differently than I think of Christopher Strip as a commercial strip. Christopher Strip is only, I think, the mega commercial strip is Avenue. It's gay. And Chelsea, 10th Avenue is gay. So, um, <laughs> Um, and I think that, or the West Highway, right? And the Crisco, Crisco Disco. Yeah, Crisco Disco used to be there. And that was the okay. Show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, um, but.
but it's just like you know my my perspective of of gamerhood is different you know it's, and it's colored by you know my age and um, and where I live you know and I don't I don't think the West Village is gay really. I don't know where you know where the boys have gone you know where the men yeah. I mean there are certainly gay people there but it's not gay like it used to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there was a string of, uh, Colin. Oh, yes, Mina, and then Colin, and then Mina. Um, actually, when we were talking about this sort of imaginary queer space, one thing that I keep thinking about and remembering, there's this concept which is still sort of developing, but the idea of queer Slavia. I'm from former Yugoslavia, and, um, and, and sort of in the fault of queer um, theorizing. And queer Slavia is a space that has never, it's this utopia that has never existed and will never be. But it's this idea of sort of these memories of the space because Yugoslavia, while on one hand was fairly utopic place to live in, at the same time the, the, there was uh, homosexuality was illegal. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that was not very uh, utopian. But it's there's this memory of this perfect place that used to be before we got squished with neoliberalism uh, and globalization and all this other stuff. And then this work toward it, but at the same time trying to respect these other needs of people who don't want to have this unified space. But it's it's this I like that idea of sort of space that has never actually existed that we all dream about and that it's yeah, never really right. Yeah. Yes, of course Lavia is like, oh it's yeah. thing I must think no, about it. There's a reason we all hung on to that for a while. It's true. Yeah. We were friends of Dorothy for a reason. Um, but it also exists in terms of uh, it exists in terms of activism because yeah. activists ac across the region do work together. So in a way it does exist. People date across the borders because it's a fairly small community. So it's fairly common to have a sort of a girlfriend boyfriend in another country. Yeah. I mean, more common, I think, than I don't know, than I see here. So sort of these like cross-border dating sites. Yeah, I, and I think what I, I mean by Oz is just the the psychology oh, of it. Yeah. When you're told that you don't have these places, it has to be the dream of a place that mm -hmm. never was or will be. Yeah. But you have to. Colin, what did you think? Yeah, um, they're all jumbled thoughts. <laughs> but I was thinking a little about what um, something Tina was saying and the idea of home, and maybe. Like one of the possible critiques of the idea of the gay neighborhood, right, is that it works through an assumption of closure. <laughs> so there always has to be like the stung outside or the, the folks who don't belong, mm -hmm. which creates maybe these tensions that allow certain violences to happen um, and don't necessarily facilitate the belonging that we think it, it will. Uh, but maybe in the concepts of like transience or placelessness we can rethink the idea of like queer space um, in a way where like we still respect it, but we don't try to reproduce ideas of like closure. Like I just want to know how to hold on to both of those ideas of a queer space, but not right necessarily like that facilitates belonging without a sense of closure. Yeah, and it's hard to do that because we feel in the, the, the psychology we feel isolated, so you feel excluded already, and you don't want to do it with someone else, but you do because you want to find people who you want to be able to cycle. Well, I think when we were um, talking about the idea of performing neighborhood and how it's yeah. actually an active Thing because there is no magical place, right? And um, I mean, maybe. Um, and <laughs> lastly, I have a problem not making things meta, so I just wanted to point out that um, our community here, we've moved. <laughs> we still found each other, so I don't know what's going on. On that note, on that note, um, we'll end up fluttering together. I'm sorry, we'll, uh, we're definitely going to Slatter's again. Um, two books that I wish I could have included in class but didn't. One is Social Women's Gentrification of the Mind. I think it's really worth reading. The other is Social Women's Gentrification of the Mind, which is a good New York book. And the other one is by James Wilson, who's actually the head of class, who's awesome. 
Bull Diver's Panties and Chocolate Babies, Performance, Race, and Sexuality in the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. um, James Wilson, just so James Wilson, Harlem, Amazon, there you go. Um, and I wanted to say that uh, this is this is the seminar in the city, free and open. If you want to join CLAGs, they are pretty much run on donations and amazing volunteers, mostly volunteer labor. There's a lot of extra labor that goes in the class. Like people in the back or seeing it through running their Twitter. And the Facebook and the facilities and AV and all of this. So if you would like to join CLAGs, you can and you don't feel obligated to and you can mail it in later or whatever. It's a wonderful thing and it gives fellowships to performers and academics and also if you are a performer or an academic and you're looking for funding, check it out. And I wanted to end with my favorite poem ever because I've loved this poem my whole life and I think it saved my life. Um, and I thought it, it reminded me of you guys because this, this class was such a treasure and I wanted to thank you all so. Um, it's called Having a Cope With You by Frank O'Hara. So Having a Cope With You is even more fun than going to San Sebastian or Ruin Hende, Beirut's Bayonne, or being sick to my stomach on the Traversa de Gracia in Barcelona. Partly because when you're armed shirt, you look like a better, happier St. Sebastian. Partly because of my love for you. Partly because of your love for yogurt. Partly because of the fluorescent orange tulips around the birches. Partly because of the secrecy our smiles take on before people and statuary. It is hard to believe when I'm with you that there can be as anything as still, as solemn, as unpleasantly definitive as statuary, when right in front of it, in the warm New York 4 o'clock light, we are drifting back and forth between each other like a tree breathing to its spectacles. And the portrait show seems to have no faces in it at all, just paint. You suddenly wonder why anyone in the world ever did them. I look at you and I'd rather look at you than all the portraits in the world, except possibly for the Polish writer occasionally. <clears throat> anyway, it's in the Frick, which thanks heavens you haven't gone to yet so we can go together for the first time. <laughs> and the fact that you move so beautifully more or less takes care of futurism, just as at home I never think of the new descending staircase, or at a rehearsal a stingle drawing of Leonardo or Michelangelo that used to wow me. And what good does all the research of the Impressionists do them when they never got the right person to stand near the tree when the sun sank? Or for that matter, Marino Marini when he didn't pick the rider as carefully as the horse. It seems they were all cheated of some marvelous experience, which is not going to go wasted on people, which is why I'm telling you about it. So thank you for sharing this and imagining and queering and LGBT -ing and performing and embodying and um, urbanizing and um, uh, sharing this, and I hope to see as many of you as possible on June 5th. And you'll get the email about um, our online world that we can create with many people everywhere. Um, and um, thank you. Thank you.